Uh, yeah, but as we continue, we've got Adrian uh, from EA, and I'll just let him go. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Nice. Yes? No? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to start real quick by presenting myself really, really quick. Um, I'm from Argentina, the south of South America. We're well known for having good meat, play football or soccer. And uh, if, if when I say that I'm from Buenos Aires, you have to know that's not in Brazil. That's actually in, in Argentina, OK? Um, I've been designing games for the last 12 years. Uh, I've been kind of all over the place. And nowadays, I design gameplay at um, FC 24, previously FIFA. So yeah, Argentina, football, yeah, it's kind of predictable. <laughs> but <clears throat> today, I'm going to talk about a tool, a game design tool that I use on a daily basis to design the games I work on. And I got to be honest, I was kind of nervous because I do think it's like there's a bunch of really experienced game designers in this room. And uh, this is more like a one on one tool. It's kind of basic. So I was worried during the week and I asked my boss who is sitting here in the audience and I told him, like, what what should I do? Like, just be upfront and tell everyone to not expect much from me. And he was like, yes, actually, you should do that. So yeah, it's good when your boss tells you to tell people to not expect much from you, right? It's, it's, it's good. It's cool. Um, so let's start with that. And the thing is that when I started as working as a game designer, I found myself more often than not in this spot. And this is not like a random Vancouver spot. It's what I mean with this image is that I found myself and having to make decisions and having to choose between two equally um, good choices, right? Like, I don't know, when an uh, engineer comes and says, hey, Adrian, we need to define the behavior of the character in this corner case uh, of, of the logic or the system that you design, and maybe I needed to make a decision right there on the spot. Maybe it didn't have enough tools as a game designer to say, yeah, it's obviously it's this way. For me, it looked just the same. It's like, oh, yeah, I don't know. Let's go this way. Um, so obviously, the first thing is that the games, the games I worked on suffered, right? Like they were not as good. But more importantly, my in my opinion, is that the team suffered as well because they were frustrated. Like, oh yeah, we're design, we're developing this game, and we have to make choices sometimes real quick because of how development works. And this guy doesn't have many tools actually to decide where to go. So. Obviously, with years and experience and learning, trying to learn, trying to get better at it, I started getting more tools, right? For example, game production tools, as I like to call them. And it's basically how the development itself tells you where the limits are. Like the development constraints are also design constraints sometimes, right? Like you cannot say, hey, let's add multiplayer to this game if you don't have an engineer that knows how to work with multiplayer, or if the engine you're working on doesn't allow for that, et cetera, et cetera, right? Or maybe, oh yeah, let's, this feature is super cool, but it will add a lot of steps in, uh, in testing, in QA, or whatever. So obviously, sometimes when I found myself in, in, in that path, I started using these tools that I earned with experience and with time to start making design decisions. And obviously, game design theory and abstract design theory that I started to use as well to start designing better and better with time. So yeah, in some cases, I found myself in this situation, right? Like, it's, it's obvious where to go. Sometimes, sometimes design is this easy, sometimes it's not. Um, but Let's, let's imagine this, like I, I still needed some tools or any way to design in any case. For example, let's imagine, yeah, you studied all about difficulty curves and the concept of flow and not make it too easy, not make it too, too hard to keep the user in the state of flow. And then you get hired by from software, right? And suddenly, what do you do with that concept? Suddenly, it's not that useful anymore, even though it made, it made sense in an abstract way. So that's where I said, OK, I, I really need to come up with a game design tool 
or methodology or framework that will allow me to solve any design issue. And that's where I came with this core focus and power methodology with years of, of working with it. And again, don't expect much from it. Thank you, Sam. Um, <clears throat> but let's start from the beginning. The initial idea is to define the core of your game. Define what is the design intent, what do you want to tell to the world uh, with this game. It's your design north, and it will. It, I usually try to make it uh, a short statement, not uh, a huge phrase with filled with things. I, I try to keep it short. And a lot of people say, oh, aren't these the design pillars? Like, it's that the same? And I say, actually not, because design pillars Usually, there are more than one, right? It's pillars. And I like to have one concept, only one, that then it will cascade into the design pillars, maybe. Um, for example, I recently had a discussion about this with one of the um, co-founders of uh, Tripwire, the uh, creators of Man Eater, and he said, yeah, our design pillars were, for this game, were eat, evolve, and explore. And we designed everything, everything that we proposed had to fall into one of those three buckets and concepts. And I said, well, and if you had to you know, shorten that and um, make only one, what would have been? And he said, it would have been be a shark, like feel like you are a shark. And the day after we met again, and he said, like, actually I was thinking, and I think it would have been beneficial if we had one concept that aligned everyone in the team, only one, and then that cascade into the three uh, design pillars that we used. So other games, yeah, I, I imagine you don't know this one. Um, <laughs> and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I am, but I, do, I think that the core of Darkest Dungeon from what I read is the affliction of dealing with cosmic horror. Yes? Yeah. Sure, yeah, whatever. Um, so, but, it's one concept, one thing that you know then um, it drives the, the design. Then in Eco, for example, a core, it's the relationship between these two characters that don't know each other, cannot communicate. But the core by the author is, uh, he said, is the relationship of these two characters. And then Fez is about perspective. That's it, like that concept, perspective. And so again, it's one short statement that defines your design north, your design intent. So this is not something new or revolutionary. Any creative industry or craft actually has this concept, or in, even in games, companies like Ubisoft, they have, they have this concept of fantasy. They, their objective is to sell this fantasy, like X fantasy to the, the users, right? Like for example, be a hacker in a dystopian San Francisco and, and that's their fantasy that they're trying to sell. And that it's useful for the marketing team to say, okay, this is, this is what we're trying to sell. But it's also internally, it's what they use to design and develop the game. It's their design north. And well, and, and then I go to one of my, an example of me applying this in one of my products, one of my designs. So I use, I, I play a lot of Magic the Gathering, and when Hearthstone came out, I, I hope nobody gets mad with this, but I felt like it was a casual version of Hearthstone. And it was cool, it was fresh, and I said, I want to design a casual version of Hearthstone, right? Like, Hearthstone is a casual version of Magic, I want to design a casual version of Hearthstone. So um, I designed this game, really quick game, three or four players. Uh, the fantasy is a group of mages go into a tavern, there's only one beer left, and they fight for it. So the, um, the setting is very Hearthstone-y. Um, it's a bit more casual because it's not 1v1 and try hearted. You cannot try hearted, you really need to talk with others. It's more like a social experience, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, that was basically the core of my game, right? Make a casual version of Hearthstone. That's my design intent. So I brought this to different events and started playtesting the prototype. 
And I realized that people actually had a lot of interaction between themselves. Like they were talking and discussing and creating alliances and backstabbing and, and I loved it because I was playing, back in the day I was playing a lot of Euro games, Euro board games where it's more like, yeah, do your thing in, in your corner, count your points, compare your points to, your, to the other players, the, one, the person with most points wins, shake your hands, go home. And if you, if you are going to be in a, you know, you're going to gather, you're going to be in the same place, interact, like fight, discuss, whatever. So when I saw that that was happening with my game, I changed my core to be generate interaction. So I said, I'm going to, I'm going to build an engine to generate interactions. That's what, what uh, mages and tyrants is going to be. So once I decided that, uh, this is the first card that I created after I, I, change the core of my game. And just for you to understand, the game is about getting three gems and the, all the game goes around getting gems faster or protecting your gems or destroying the other player's gems. And this card, what it says is destroy one gem, but if another player pays an orb, which is like a basic resource in the game, then instead destroy two. So let's say player number one has two gems, Player number two has an orb, and I have fire. I play fire to destroy one gem, but player two pays an orb, and now we destroy two. Chaos, right? Like, it, it not only destroys gems, it also destroys relationships. <laughs> so, I, this is a, a picture of the first time that I play tested the game with this card in it. And this is a game dev meetup in Buenos Aires. And where is Buenos Aires? <laughs> so this is the first time in, in well in a game dev meetup in Buenos Aires with a bunch of game devs and they were all really try harding it. They were just playing it in silence. They were they were not talking. Ten minutes in, they didn't say a word. And I was like, this is this sucks. Like <laughs> this is definitely not achieving the my objectives. And at one point, one one of them played fire to a guy that had two gems, and another one silently just placed an orb on top of it. <laughs> Again, chaos. Like, it, that's when he said like, hey, why are you supporting this attack if I helped you? Yeah, but you helped me because this other one actually helped you, and, but, and it was a five minutes discussion, no exaggerating, like they were playing for 10 minutes and now they spent five minutes discussing about that play. And I was like, yeah, this is it. This is what I wanted to create. <laughs> so the, the problem is that I had a bunch of cards. I had like 20 cards, uh, a, a big lineup, well, medium lineup of cards. And, and, and I was like, yeah, fire does, you know, it, it aims to the core, but what about the rest of the cards? So that is a good segue for the second portion of the methodology, which is focus. And the idea of focus is to have the mindset of making sure that everything you put in the game, it's aiming to the core. So nothing, and we'll see some examples, nothing should be aiming somewhere else. Everything should be, um, should try to uh, convey into the vision or the design intent that you have. So what I did in this exercise that now I call focus, but in, back in the day it was just I went home and I was kind of excited that fire worked in, in that way, but I said, what about the rest of the cards? So I displayed all, all the cards in, on top of a table and I started saying, okay, these make, this generate interactions, these do not. And I took the ones that didn't and I started working with them in order to make focus, right? So, for example, Plagiarism is a card that is completely broken. It's a free card, all the yellow, all the yellow cards are free to play, cost zero. And what it does is copies the effect of anything that happened. So you play Fire against me, I play Plagiarism for, for zero, I copy it. So I, when, I, when I play tested this with people that used to play a lot of Magic the Gathering or more mathematical, game designers, they were like, no man, you, ne you need to take this card out. What is, <laughs> what is this? It's a joke. And so I was considering taking it out, but after I changed the core of my game to be generate interactions, 
this was the star. This is the best card in the game and is one of the it's it's the one that generates the most interactions because out of nowhere you can be participating in the play that you were not even involved in the beginning. You can it's it's really really fun and it generates a lot of interactions. So it's it was like I'm not only going to keep it, I'm going to add more copies of it. Then we have Nullify, which is a basically a counter spell in Magic. It counters anything, it cancels something that happened. And I had several copies of this, and it worked kind of the other way around. When, pe when a lot of people had a bunch of this in the table, it stalled the game, and people stopped interacting and stopped doing things. So what I did, it, it was instead of having like five copies, I tuned it down to three or something like that, and it kept the thing going while still giving you tools to react to what the rest of the players uh, did. And then a uh, nice example is, is Circle of Protection, which is a card that um, if someone attacks you, you can use it to protect your gems from that attack. It's like a counter spell, but only for attacks. And this card originally said protects you from one attack, prote protects your gems from one attack. And I changed the wording to say protects any player from an attack. So you can use it potentially to protect another player. It rarely happens, but the game is telling you that you can do it, that you can interact. So that was the, the basically the, let's go back a little bit. That was my exercise of doing focus to the core. Um, and even though the core is a pretty well known concept in, in as I said, in different creative industries, um, I, I wasn't finding any reference of something similar in a, a, something similar to this exercise of doing a conscious focus and a conscious effort to make everything fit in that vision until I reached this uh, concept, mise en scène, which is I'm gonna explain, the, is explain it very poorly, but bear with me. Um, but it's basically in the cinematography industry, if the movie is following this concept of mise en scène, it means that everything you see, you, you can pause the game, the, the game, you can pause the movie at any moment, and everything you see there is there for a reason. So everything from the frame uh, to the lighting to the wardrobe to the makeup to whatever is happening there, everything is there put is put there for a reason, and not just because. Taking that in consideration and going back to an example of something that I did, this was a, a game that I worked on, an action multiplayer game about flying militarized drones that fought each other. And basically like World of Tanks, but with drones. And the, the idea or the fantasy was you are fighting the war of the future, flying this, flying, fighting with this flying tanks from the safety of your bunker. It's horrible. As a core, it's breaking my rule, okay? But let's, let's uh, accept it's like a long phrase. But it does have this, this thing, this power fantasy of I'm flying this huge tank that is floating in the air. So in that regard, we started working, or we had in the backlog the, the task of doing uh, decals, like when you shoot uh, concrete in the wall, to you know, have an effect and leave a decal and whatnot. And that was one of the things that we were going to do, of course. But I took that and I reprioritized it and I said, hey, we need to really, really work on this to sell the fantasy, to be able to focus in that, in that core and really make people that when they're missing their shots and they're hitting the, the buildings to feel like they're a flying tank. So suddenly effects, like visual effects, were really important. Um, or for example, this is the, the hub of the game and where you choose your loadout, your, your drones and whatnot. And we spent a lot of resources in making the, the background and the environment feel like it was your bunker and your character, which was you, um, lived there and it was in the safety of this place and you were there tinkering around with your drones that then you send to, to fight outside, right? So things like the, the, the background in the hub or the particle effects, things like that, that suddenly everything was trying to aim to the core. 
And there are, there are some, thing, some games like Eco, going back to this example, because it's pretty interesting. The, um, I cannot remember the name of the creative director, but he said that they, were, they had this core, which was the relationship between these two characters. And they started developing a lot of like a really complex fighting system, a combat system, and, and super complex puzzles and features and whatnot. And suddenly he was playing the game and he said, this is not about, this is not about the, the, the relationship anymore. This is just another action puzzle platformer game. So they started subtracting and he called this design by subtraction. And he started taking things out, 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 out. I think he went too far. Now it's pretty minimalistic, but it's perfect because everything that is there talks about the relationship about this, uh, between these two characters. Even, for example, to save the game, both characters just need to lay down in, in, in this couch and, and that's when you save the game. <clears throat> and even, for example, the name of the game can be pretty literal, but still make, fo make focus to the core. And it takes to this game that is, everything is cooperative and it's the story of these two characters and everything is about this cooperation and playing together and working together and figuring things out together. Even the name, pretty obvious in this case, but even the name and the, the, the IP makes focus to that core. So the first two are, the first two steps of this are kind of obvious. Again, core, again, pretty common uh, thing in, in any creative industry. Focus, even in cinematography, we have that, and it's it's like a, it's a good practice. But then I I started noticing that a lot of games actually had an extra to it. I, even though some games can be can make focus to the core and have a pretty defined core, maybe they're still lacking something, and they need an extra step. And this is what I try to do now with my games, adding the power to it. I don't know if it's, the be if it's the best name to it, but I, I don't know. We can discuss later. So <clears throat> the idea is you can, have, um, you can have the core, you can have the focus, and then you should take one of the things that is aiming, obviously that it's aiming to the core, and just taking one, ex one extra step, take it, take it the extra mile. And I'm gonna give an example of someone that did this and went through this process. And it's Robert Abbott, which is um, a programmer that he liked to design games with poker cards. I don't know why, but that's what he did. And he, he, decided, he designed this game called Babel that is basically, um, he got inspired by the stockbrokers discussing when this was more in person, not as digital. And he felt like that was a very, playful experience or sequence or moment. And he said, I want to design a game that puts you in this situation when you play it, right? That, that was uh, his core. So he designed a game where you are dealt 10 cards and the objective is to get cards to create um, groups of cards, the same as in poker. And the way to do it is just by negotiating with the other people. So it's a four to six uh, players game. And that's basically in, in like changing cards with the others until you get your, your things. Then you, you give those, um, those cards that you, when you made the group and you get points, you're dealt new cards and go back to it. So there's no turns. You have this exchange mechanics and there's a numeric outcome. So you could tell, like he had a very well-defined core. He was doing focus, everything in the game was aiming there, but there was something missing. Like this didn't feel, I, I even played it this way. And yeah, it's a fun game, it's kind of messy, but it's, 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 not, it's not the experience. It's not actually achieving the goal of putting people in that situation. So what he did was he decided to come up with a way to make this game playable by infinite people if, if wanted. So ch he changed some um, score, how the scores worked. He changed a couple of rules and he said, if you have enough cards, you can play with 2000 people if you want at the same time. And let me tell you, this really feels like this. 
when you're when you're playing imagine if we are all here together exchanging cards and someone is shouting i need the king of spades and someone yeah i have one what do you have and it's pure chaos and so i'm convinced and well this is i one time we tried this at, a, at an event in in buenos aires as well and yeah what what i like about this is how he went from having the core have make everything made focus, but he still needed something something extra. So then he created this massive multiplayer mode and he got it. It was a bold decision, but he he did it. And the thing is like how how to be able to come up with these ideas, how like focus sorry, the core is something that you define, something that you decide, okay, I'm gonna make a game about this or this. Focus is just making sure everything lines up. There are a lot of techniques, uh, but I think we're, we know about that. But power, how to come up with a crazy idea, a bold statement that makes the, your game feel fresh, feel unique, bless you. Um, it's, so this is what I'm still trying to figure out. Spoiler, this is what I'm still trying to figure out, but I do have a couple of ideas, and I've been investigating uh, how games and movies and, and other, other products actually do this. And one of the ways that I find really, really interesting is the, can someone that knows that English is their native language read this for me? Hyperbole. Hyperbole. Okay, thank you. I didn't know how to pronounce it. So, hyperbole. Okay. Um, so taking something to the extreme, taking exaggerating something. So this is a rhetoric um, uh, tool to say, yeah, it makes something really, really extreme, like the stream version of it. So for example, how many of you saw this movie, The Bartle Fly Effect? Okay, this is a movie about paradoxes and, and travel, time travel. And it's interesting, it's, it's entertaining. Uh, it has a couple of good ideas. It's Ashton Kutcher goes to the past and he's able to change something real, really small in, in an event of his childhood and that then when he wakes up in the present day, everything changed. Like as, how a small change in the past can change everything, right? Like the butterfly effect, uh, blah, blah, blah. So it, it's good. But what would happen if you take this and Put power, the power element, just take it to an extreme. Take this, this concept and just mess with it and go extreme with it. And I think, how many of you saw this show, Dark? Okay, I'm gonna give a small spoiler here. I'm sorry, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, this, is, this is such an extreme take on the concept of paradoxes that there is one person that she is her own mother and daughter at the same time. Okay, and it's, it's a small spoiler, but it's that extreme. And I'm pretty sure they said, what is the most extreme paradox we can come up with? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you're your father and son at the same time. Wow, what? And then they just did a lot of other stuff. That's only one thing, okay? But that's, I, I do think they took this concept of time travels and paradoxes and they just went crazy with it with the power element of hyperbole. <laughs> Correct? Okay. <laughs> then another one that I like is the contrast or the extreme opposite. So if the hyperbole is going vertical and going into one direction, the farthest you can go, this one is just taking your concept and see what are the opposites and just go from one to the other to impress and to make something memorable. And there's a very curious example that is the one that triggered me this, like this thought, and it's the Hacksaw Ridge. How many of you saw this movie? Okay, just a few, okay. Well, this is a movie about World War II and how a Christian soldier didn't want to use weapons, uh, but he wanted to be um, um, medic, he just wanted to save people and not fight, uh, but they didn't, he didn't want to even grab a weapon. He just wanted to go with medical stuff and that's it. So he had a lot of trouble because everyone said, well, you at least need to have one. And there was a lot of whatever until he got it and he went to the war. But here's the thing, 
this movie is a Mel Gibson movie, and the first half, it's super colorful. The dialogues are kind of silly. It's all, everything is blurry. It feels like in a in a dream. Um, and and even like one of the bar, bad surgeons that it's supposed to be like really mean and and make him have a bad time is a comedy actor that I don't remember the name, but I'm pretty sure that was on purpose. It's an actor that you never see in action, you never take him seriously, and now he was like being the bad surgeon. So it's like I, I cannot take you seriously, and that's the first half of the movie and everyone is like mm, you should take a weapon he's like no i'm a christian and everything is like kind of silly and then it comes the second part and it's a mel gibson movie it's fucked up <laughs> it's when they go up in the Huxley ridge and there's silence and fog and whatever and the first shot, the first bullet is shot and it hits the head of one of his friends that previously was like, eh, eh. and now it's like he's dead right next to him. And it's 30 minutes of nonstop super graphical violence. Whoa. It's <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that he like it wouldn't feel the same way if the sergeant was a really bad dude and everything all the dialogues were serious and because you were you would have been prepared for this but he actually goes puts you through this path of silliness and suddenly just wakes you up with this so that felt powerful and that felt like a good resource um, to use this contrast between two things so to to close it um, the three steps I usually use now when designing games is the first one, the beginning of the project, I ask myself, what is the core of my game? Then every time a feature is proposed, I ask myself, does this feature aim to the core or not? If not, I take it out. And if, if it does, then I try to think, if, is there any way of taking this, this feature to the extreme? And the results are that you have a design north. The, if you have a core, if you define that pretty well from the beginning, you have a design north and you have a shared vision. Remember when, when I talked about the team suffering because of my bad design choices? Um, now we all have the same vision and we can all discuss and where to go next and what to do because we will be sharing that vision. Then if you make focus, you will have a solid product, a cohesive message. And if you find that power element, you will have a unique product or a memorable experience for sure. So yeah, every time I find myself in this situation, now I actually find myself in this situation, knowing pretty clearly where to go next. Thank you. Let's do one question. One question. Good question. <laughs> Hi, are you familiar with uh, drip down design? It's a little thing I've kind of come across in my own little adventures, but what you said rings really true to this, where you want to have that core philosophy, or let's say you're making an action game. You know, what are the three then most important components of it? So maybe that's smart enemies, good maps, and uh, cool guns. And then you then tackle you know, the cool guns what well, makes up a cool weapon. And so it find, I find it's like a natural way to progress a design document when you have a good core pillar and you keep diluting it down to three, 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 or you know, whatever magic number you want to use. Um, would you have anything to say on this type of approach to designing games? No, it sounds, it sounds interesting as well. And it sounds aligned to this. Like I, I, I think I kind of simplify it with have one core and then try to understand what what are the design pillars that will aim there. Maybe it's two, three, four, five. The less, the better. Actually, I like the, nine, the number three. Um, but then the rest, if you like that structure view of, yeah, keep continuing down the rabbit hole of three, 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 I think it's valid. I personally don't use it. I think that you, you have enough guidance with one core and maybe some design pillars, you have enough guidance and enough wiggle room 
to be able to improvise and still be very creative uh, inside of that. And it gives you the, again, again enough guidance to, for everyone to be aligned. And I don't know if I would go and add more and more and more, more gui uh, guidelines and, and make it that strict, but I don't know. It, it's, it's actually interesting. I would like to know more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next.